You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. While the news of President John F. Kennedy's assassination shocked the world, there were two related murders during that fateful November weekend. University of Minnesota Humanities professor James Norwood explains. Now, during the weekend that began on Friday, November 22nd, when the president was assassinated, there were some other extraordinary events. Probably the most extraordinary was the shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald as he was about to be transported out of, I believe, the Dallas police headquarters. He was shot by uh, Jack Ruby. Who is Jack Ruby, and, and why did Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald intersect so fatefully. Uh, yes, first it must be mentioned that there was another murder committed on the day of the assassination and that was the death of officer J.D. Tippett. Uh, Tippett was killed also under very murky circumstances and after he was killed almost immediately it was argued that Oswald was the killer of Tippett as well as JFK. Now, that murder didn't get investigated either. So when one studies the Tippett killing, uh, it is also a kind of Rashomon of evidence where one can see conflicting stories, different eyewitness accounts, uh, very confusing forensic evidence. Uh, and the actual placement of Oswald in the location at 10th and Patton in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, when the, all of the evidence points to him already being seated in the Dallas Theater at that time, the Texas Theater on Jefferson Boulevard, uh, suggests that Oswald did not kill Tippett either. Now, the shooting of Oswald occurred on Sunday. It was Sunday morning following the assassination over the weekend. And it is uh, arguably the first live killing ever shown on American television, uh, where to the horror of the viewers who were following the events, the assassination weekend, Oswald was being transferred from the city headquarters of the Dallas police to the county facility, actually right in Dealey Plaza, where it was believed he would be more secure, uh, ironically. Uh, so the transfer took place on Sunday morning, and as Oswald was being protected, at least in the security of approximately 70 Dallas police officers, a nightclub owner by the name of Jack Ruby entered somehow got into the basement, stepped forward, and shot Oswald in the stomach. Oswald was then transferred to Parkland Hospital, the same hospital where JFK was taken and pronounced dead, and it was there that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was pronounced dead as well from the shot from Jack Ruby. Ruby is a shadowy figure whose background, if we trace it very carefully, shows ties to uh, the American government. He was a known FBI informant going all the way back to the time of Richard Nixon and the House on American Activities Committee in the late 1940s. He was a gun runner uh, in the employ, uh, obviously, of the CIA in running guns uh, to uh, Cuba. And so there are many unanswered questions about Jack Ruby. After the Warren Commission report came out, there were subsequent reports that came in later years. For example, the Clark Panel, Rockefeller Commission, the Church Committee, and the House Select Committee on Assassinations. What did these subsequent investigatory bodies reveal or perhaps even contradict uh, from the Warren report? This is an important topic that's going to really be the basis of much of the course that I'm offering through the Learning Life program on the Kennedy assassination. And to study those stages of the assassination in inquiry and the aftermath is extremely instructive because each one of those investigatory bodies eventually uncovers new and important information about the assassination. So it's worth our while to have that timeline, the chronology of all the new things that we learn decade by decade in the various investigations. A, a turning point really is 
one that's not a government investigation, but a personal and private investigation by Jim Garrison, the district attorney in New Orleans, because he really sparked a new interest in the case in the late 1960s when he formally charged, arrested and charged, one man that he thought was complicit in the assassination of JFK. The Garrison trial then unfolded, and Clay Shaw, who was put on trial, was acquitted uh, by the jury, who, after the case was over, said that Garrison had made a very strong case that there was a plot to kill the president. They just couldn't find conclusively that there was evidence against Clay Shaw. The key issue on which Garrison's case revolved was that Clay Shaw was associated with the CIA. He denied that on the witness stand. Garrison was able to, unable to provide definitive proof. But years later, due especially to the House Select Committee in the 1970s, the truth came out that Clay Shaw was, in fact, associated with the CIA. So the Garrison trial was significant as a turning point. It then led, especially in the wake of Watergate, uh, to more accountability from government that led to the Rockefeller Commission, the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And then in the 1990s, the ARRB, the Assassination Records Review Board, that came about due to the effect of Oliver Stone's JFK film, and then unsealed files, released new documents for the public, and conducted key interviews that were especially revealing to shed new light on the case. So here we are on the eve of the 50th anniversary, and we now have so much information that it's possible to pull it together and understand what happened in the death of President Kennedy. It's been 50 years almost since the assassination in November of 1963. Many of our viewers were not even alive when that event took place. Why do you think people of all ages, of all generations, remain so fascinated with the Kennedy assassination? Well, one reason certainly is that we do not have closure yet on this subject. And no matter what the degree of expertise or knowledge, uh, people get involved in this a little and realize that there is just so much confusion and contradictory evidence that it's an incomplete episode in our nation's history. Another important fact is that of the significance of the event itself, what a turning point it was in our nation's history. Um, keep in mind that on the Monday following the assassination, a major policy of our nation had changed, and that was our commitment to the war in Vietnam. Uh, JFK was ready to withdraw the advisors. He had formulated a plan to bring back a thousand advisors by the end of 64 and to completely end any involvement of America in Vietnam by 1965. All of that changed with the incoming president, Lyndon Johnson. And it happened almost instantly over the assassination weekend. And so Dan Rather, the CBS commentator, said famously that on Tuesday, Americans went back to work and we went back on our course uh, as Americans. Well, the course of America did change on that date because the Pentagon had already concluded that the draft was going to be increased and that we had to anticipate approximately 50,000 casualties of American military in the commitment to Vietnam. So our history radically changed with that event. It was a turning point, and in studying the assassination, it sheds light on the entire evolution of our nation in the last uh, 50 years. It's also important, I think, to study this topic because of the actual legacy of President Kennedy. This was a man who was interested in looking at diplomacy as a main way to solve the world's problems as opposed to necessarily military engagement. He had developed plans for detente with Khrushchev in the Soviet Union, with Castro in Cuba. 
uh, kinds of approaches that anticipated what would not come until the 1980s with Mikhail Gorbachev and his policy of glasnost. And even in Africa, even today, John F. Kennedy is celebrated as a great liberator, someone who championed the nationalism of African nations and actually championed Arab nationalism in the Arab states, especially uh, Egypt. So it's worth our while to understand the man and his legacy uh, that really marks a watershed in our history in the last half century. Professor James Norwood, thank you so much for joining us on Access Minnesota. Thank you, Jim. It was a pleasure. That's all for this edition of Access Minnesota. We'll see you again next month. Thanks for watching. Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Join us again next week as we bring you the newsmakers and stories that shape our everyday lives. Access Minnesota is produced by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association in cooperation with the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts.